So first, let's get the setting. What is the Maw? It's a zone. The Maw was a max level outdoor zone for the Shadowlands expansion, and it was one which was incredibly disliked. In fact, it might be one of the most disliked zones in the entire game's history, which is really weird to think about. Well, for me specifically, because I really liked it. In this video, let's explore why this zone had such a negative perception, and why it may have actually been a lot better than anyone might think. In order to talk about this, we really have to go back in time to discuss max level zones as a whole, because this is very important to give context on why this zone was so incredibly disliked. The first max level zone we had was the Island of Quel'Donnas. This was a max level zone out of the Burning Crusade, and offered the very first daily quest hub where you can go there in order to complete quests in order to earn reps so that you could buy strong weapons, trinkets, and high-level recipes. This was revolutionary at the time, because it finally gave you a way to do solo content at max level, which could progress the power level of your character. You see, World of Warcraft became pretty famous for being one of the first MMOs that allowed you to actually progress the power level of your character by yourself. Other MMOs at the time it made it incredibly difficult to level by yourself, or you just had to grind for so long that it wasn't worth leveling by yourself. And WoW was very revolutionary in that it had an abundance of quests to actually do while leveling, and you could actually hit max level without having to mob grind. It was kind of a baby mode MMO for the time, and hardcore players kind of made fun of it for being too easy to level up in. However, this eventually became the industry standard. Turns out, people like to be able to progress the power level of their characters quickly without having to group up from level 1. But once you reach max level, you came to a complete halt on being able to progress the power level of your character without grouping up. Now, you might be saying this is an MMO, which is a community-driven game. Of course you would have to group up in order to get stronger. But there's also people who just really like to play by themselves in a community-based game. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but there's just something more appealing about seeing other people around while you're doing stuff by yourself as well as having a living, breathing auction house where you're able to buy and sell things to other people. These things can't really be done in a single player game, even if you enjoy a lot of the single player content. So the types of people who really enjoyed leveling and all the gameplay associated to that kind of ran out of materials to do once they hit max level, besides farming out cosmetics. There's a million and one things you can farm at max level, but none of those really increase the power level of your character. So no matter how many pets and mounts you obtain, you're still going to be hitting mobs max level zones just as hard as you were a month ago when you capped out your character. In fact, there's a lot of people who would just play a new expansion to level their characters more, and then quit pretty soon after they get their main character to max level, just because they really enjoy the solo content that increases the power level of their character. So let's go back to the Isle of Quel'Donnas. They finally figured out that people like being able to do world content in order to increase the power level of their character. And the daily quest hub was a huge success. So in the next expansion, they iterated on it and were like, we're going to have a whole bunch of daily quest hubs for max level characters. And they kind of kept doing this all the way until Mist of Handaria, when they got to the apex of daily quests. And players were tired of them by now. Blizzard knew that players like to do things that increase the power level of the characters in the open world after they hit max level, but they were tired of that content only being daily quests. And they were not ready to give players really good gear for solo content quite yet. So they tried something new with the Timeless Isle. This was a max level zone that had weekly quests instead of dailies, and there was currency and rep to farm, which basically just gave cosmetics. But also a lot of catch-up gear for your waltz. Really good catch-up gear too. However, the activities required to get all this was more than just completing the weekly quests, as there was also a unique thing called random treasures that you could find, and a lot of these random treasures required you to do puzzles in order to unlock them. And a lot of these mobs on the island were elite, so it was difficult to navigate as well, unless you were really geared. And since the island was pretty tough, it made your power level gains feel better when you could start completing it quicker than before. There's actually a large subset of incredibly rich players who will pay for carries and max level content just to get better gear so they can farm faster on their own. The power progression of an RPG is just really addicting. It's one of the reasons MMOs can be so addicting to certain types of people. You get a whole bunch of small goals met, and you can very quickly and easily see the progress of your power, by how much quicker you can complete stuff that used to take you a lot longer in the past. Think of it like lifting weights and seeing progress after a few hours as opposed to a few months. The immediate gratification rewards is what tricks your brain into thinking you're having fun. And tricking your brain into thinking you're having fun is basically why people play video games. It doesn't really matter if you're tricking yourself, what matters is the end result, and that's having fun. But this video isn't about psychology and why things are fun, it's about max level zones and the maw. The Timeless Isle is very important to this. You see, the Timeless Isle was such a success that it became the new standard that the island of Kaldanus had set up. 
In the next expansion world of the Draenor, the Tana Jungle was the new max level questing zone for players. Well, it was supposed to be. You see, it was meant for it to be the max level zone at the launch world of the Draenor, but wasn't actually added until the last patch because the whole expansion was a mess. But they took heavy inspiration from the Timeless Isle, where basically they just had weekly and daily quests to send you out in the world and a whole bunch of mini events, rares, and treasures to find in order to get catch up gear and cosmetics. However, players were getting tired of this system pretty quickly. In the next expansion of Legion, they introduced world quests, where basically went onto the world in order to find quests rather than getting them from a central questing hub. World quests were incredibly popular on its introduction, and the reason for this was because they were easier than ever and provided power increases to your character. You see, Legion had the artifact weapons which could be fed artifact power in order to increase their power level. And your artifact weapon was basically an infinite power system, where you could always upgrade the power level of your character. And pretty much everything gave artifact power, including a large amount of it coming from world quests, and doing emissary quests, or you complete four world quests for a particular faction in order to get a bonus cache, which could have a chance to give you a legendary item. So you were heavily incentivized to do world quests in Legion, and the rewards were possibly insanely good if you got a legendary item. In addition, they were insanely easy. One of the factions called the Wardens basically had a series of world quests where you just went out and killed a singular mob. And since a lot of people would only do Warden world quests, this mob would usually die in less than 30 seconds. It was easily the fastest world quest you could do, and you can complete an entire emissary quest in his own by just doing all the Warden world quests there, and basically finish the emissary quest in less than 5 minutes. When BFA launched, they basically had the same system as before, but they decided to make the Warden Star World Quest harder, making the mobs actually require a group of people to take down and having less of them per zone. And BFA even had an infinite power system too, in order to incentivize people to go out into the world, just without the legendaries as a gotcha style incentive. But once people got raid gear, they could take down these Warden Star World Quests pretty quickly, just like before. And people were kind of upset that there were so few of them but people were getting kind of sick of world quests at this time too. So with one of the raid launches, Blizzard released two max level islands at the same time, those being Nashatar and Mechagon. Mechagon was kind of like a timeless isle retrain with lots of fun little systems that were exclusive to the island and even gave you the ability to fly around the island a little bit quicker before flying was unlocked. And Nashatar was more of a standard max level zone that was more daily quest focused and brought about rare hunting and camping, a system that had been in the game since Mr. Pandaria but wasn't really codified into max level world content until Nashatar and Mechagon, and players actually liked this duo island system, but only once flying was unlocked. Basically, they hated Nashatar because it was so hard to navigate on a ground mount, but Mechagon had a pass because it was much smaller, and there was ways to get flying earlier. But once flying was unlocked, as it was unlocked during this patch that introduced these two islands, players enjoyed them much more, even though they were both basically just copies of the Timeless Isle again, except with timed rares in order to fly around with a group of people and farm them once a day, as well as there being world quests to the island to do as well. Then for the final patch, they also released two new max level zones that had activities which could increase the power level of your character. However, they weren't as fleshed out as Mechagon or Nashatar, and people just did not care for another zone in order to do world quests in. Then we come over to the Maw the next iteration of a max level zone. And the Maw is completely different from everything prior. For one, they don't allow you to mount up at all. And not only do they not allow you to mount up, but it's intentionally designed in order to be kind of hard to navigate in a lot of parts. Basically taking the ground mount version of Nashatar up to the next level. Additionally, you have a time limit for how long you can even be in the zone because there's an Eye of the Jailer mechanic that punishes you for completing objectives. And once you hit level five, it becomes like a Grand Theft Auto 5-star system where everything starts running after you, and you also continuously lose health until you just die. Also, there's no world quests on the map, you just kind of have to run into them. Grouping up in the Maw was actually difficult at the start, because they made you go back to the central hub in order to zone in with each other. You can only really group up with people that you physically saw in the open world because of the system. And the zone had penalties for dying too. You see, the Maw wasn't 100% necessary to increase the power level of your character. In fact, they rarely make max level zones absolutely necessary, outside of a few bare minimum things. But there were some really nice upgrades to it that people really wanted. The two biggest being the ability to increase the item level of your conduits, which was a direct power level gain to your character, and being able to buy an item that lets you put extra sockets on your gear. Now, the power level increases of both these things are not higher than just doing a raid and getting a full set of raid gear, but they did increase the power level of your character, so a lot of people felt like they were forced to do them in order to at least get the conduit upgrades. And players who were used to being able to fly around max level zones since Wrath of the Lich King 
all of a sudden being grounded to running speed in order to basically get the same amount of rewards as they used to get in the past was a huge change. Basically, the amount of time and effort required to get what you could during Legion with spamming reward and world quests went from an activity that usually took less than 5 minutes to an activity that could take 30 minutes to an hour. And all the while, you had to be constantly on alert, because the Maw was incredibly dangerous too. During the beginning stages of the expansion, players are at their weakest point, so a lot of the people would start their journey into the Maw with a whole bunch of questing green items. And the Maw was full of really tough enemies, and also just random roaming elites. And also, just a few weeks prior, players were at their strongest point ever in the history of the game, because corruptions made players probably stronger than at any other point in Warcraft. So players on a whole were just heavily nerfed. So people who were exploring the Maw in order to get their power upgrades were incredibly cheesed at how long it took, and also at how difficult it was, and how it was basically required in order to unlock certain things. All these things just created resentment from the player base. And it's very understandable why, when you look at it in the context of max level zones throughout WoW's history up to this point. However, if we remove the context of its status as a daily quest hub, and what its rewards were, and look at the zone for what it is on its own, I think we have a little bit of a hidden gem here. The Maw itself is kind of really well designed to an extent. The idea of it is that it's supposed to be like a really hard version of the game that you can do on your own and get properly rewarded for these efforts. And in order to actually make this max level zone difficult, since pretty much all past max level zones were brain dead easy, they made it so the currency you acquire in the zone can be dropped when you die. You needed Stygia currency in order to buy upgrades that allowed you to traverse the zone easier, upgrades for Torghast, to buy the conduit upgrades, the extra gem slots, and to get Red with Venari. And higher with Venari allowed you to buy items that allowed you to stay in the mall longer, and also unlocked more zones that you could explore because you were kind of limited to a small portion of the Maw at first, and you would unlock more and more of it as you increased your rep, eventually getting to a point where that part of the zone was just full of elite mobs that you can no longer solo. So having Stygia was very important, and losing half of it when you died heavily incentivized that you did not die. But the zone was hard enough where it was kind of difficult to accomplish this. There were constantly roaming mobs everywhere, and since you could not mount, it was easy to accidentally run into one of them or pull more of them while you were just fighting something else. And because it was such a pain to navigate, when you finally got the grappler gun upgrade, and the portals allowed you to teleport halfway across the zone, it was a huge quality of life improvement that made it feel like you were tackling the mod itself. Instead of only getting power level upgrades for your character, you were getting upgrades for the zone itself to make it less punishing. So you were heavily incentivized to have as much Stygia as possible, and pretty much everything you fought would drop Stygia. But if you tried to hoard it, it would just increase the tension every time you try to do a big pull, because there's a chance you might lose your Stygia, and then die when you were trying to retrieve your Stygia from your corpse, because there was no ghost system in the Maw. If you died, you'd revive at a designated revival point, and had to run back to your corpse in order to get your Stygia. But if you died on your way there, you would permanently lose the Stygia you dropped, and have to run back to your new corpse location in order to recover whatever you had left. And because of this difficulty, it created a fun little minigame of using whatever toolkit your class had available to them in order to navigate the Maw with as little risk as possible. I know in my priest, I made heavy use of Mind Soothe in order to sneak past mobs, a spell that I would never use basically at any other point in the game. It was actually so useful, I just had it on my normal easy to press keybind for the first time in my entire history of using the ability. And also, since there were so many roaming mobs, one of them would ride around on a mount where if you killed it, you could pick up the mount and ride it for a minute. And this lasted just long enough where it basically would take you halfway across the zone. So traveling from one daily quest location to the other was actually not that difficult because these mobs were everywhere. In fact, the mob that dropped the mount was so abundant that I'm sure many players hated it because it was constantly joining on fights because they'd run right up to you while you were fighting something else. So navigating the zone on a mount for long stretches of time was actually not that difficult. But a lot of the time, you were only moving a very short amount of distance from one place to another. And it wasn't really worth trying to seek one of these roaming mobs out in order to get a mount for a small journey. So for the most part, you were walking or running around. And you were kind of subjected to whatever your class's movement speed abilities were. On my priest, my movement skills were very limited, so I made sure to get as much plus speed enchants and gems as possible, and basically created a Maw set that I would only use while doing content in the Maw. In fact, there was even a four set bonus that only gave you bonuses while you were in the Maw in order to make it easier, called the Instructable Exiles Garb set. At the two set bonus, it would increase your movement speed by 10% while in the Maw, which was actually a pretty huge speed increase for a piece of equipment. And also the four set, it would increase your leech by 10%, which was also a pretty significant amount of leech. And in order to get this force set, you basically had to complete a hidden quest, 
where you had to go around and kill specific mobs in order to get specific items, which allowed you to summon other mobs at specific points, but it required you to have three other people in order to summon them in order to fight these elites, which only had a chance of dropping one piece of equipment, so you'd have to do it again and again. And I really loved having to customize my character specifically for the maw. I didn't have to do this for any of the other max level zones in previous expansions. Sure, I could have a set of talents or gear that was made for world quests, so that you could do them a little bit faster, but nothing like the min-max and I did in order to make the maw easier. And I loved min-maxing my character for the maw. I also loved learning every little thing about it in order to make the required activity easier and kind of just kept doing it even after I got all the rewards a few months into the expansion. The maw was something in the game that I didn't know I had actually felt was missing. I had always enjoyed leveling new characters in Warcraft, and even though it's not necessary, I would sometimes have fun at mid-level points before I hit max level in order to just min-max my character for the content. Generally, this kind of stopped happening in retail once they made questing really easy, but it's something I really enjoyed doing while playing Classic as well, and especially in the hardcore servers. And I think the Maw is probably the closest representation of retail WoW to the Classic hardcore servers we ever got, because both of them heavily punish you for dying, which heavily incentivizes you to mid-max your character for the outdoor content that you're doing. And since I really loved questing, but I didn't like the world quests at all, the Maw was kind of scratching that itch that I was missing for my max level world content. I liked how difficult everything was, from having to sneak around mobs because there was just too many of them at certain points, to having to hunt down a roaming mob in order to get a mount to travel faster for a bit, to actually getting panicked when I pulled a little bit too many mobs and had to run away, otherwise I might lose my Stygia, to min-maxing my character's talents and gear in order to have an easier time there. All of this was just a breath of fresh air, and even made me want to play my druid and working characters just to see how they would fare in the maw being able to actually use a version of a mount. In addition, I was a huge fan of the lore parts of the Maw as well. You see, the NPC you interact with exclusively for the Maw is named Venari. She's a broker who's been stuck in the Maw for who knows how long, and is very mysterious about why she's there and what she's all about, and would swear to secrecy to never tell anyone about her, which was actually referenced in other places that had nothing to do with the Maw. In fact, there was an NPC who would show up dressed like Venari asking you questions, trying to trick you into acknowledging her existence. Venari is probably just one of my favorite side NPCs in the game, period, and I was really excited to see where her lore was going next. Also throughout the zone, they had a lot of hard-to-kill NPCs as well as treasures that would drop things called Ma lore items, which had really interesting stories attached to them. Like for example, the Tormentor's Note. This is an item that when you turn into Venari, she'll remark about how vivid the description is and give you a warning about not failing your efforts against the Jailer, otherwise this might happen to you. And what the note details is basically the kinds of tortures they did to a Night of Maw Walker, because one of the things you'll learn when you get into the Maw is that there are other Maw Walkers besides you throughout the history of the Maw. But eventually, they all got caught and were experimented on for being so unique and that they were also able to freely travel out of the Maw, something that's impossible for normal people. The note goes on to say that their test number one was physical pain, but that the subject was highly resistant to all physical methods. Test number two was sound, where they would play gnomish tavern jigs, which ended up being a failure because it caused the Maw Sworn to abandon their post, and almost allowed the Maw Walker to escape. And test number three was force visualization, where they forced her to watch the burning of Teldrassil over a hundred times, stating that she finally broke on her 115th viewing. It concluded that the results were astounding, in that they were able to get 10 times the normal amount of anima from her. What's even sadder is that you find her note on her dead body in the Maw, showing she managed to escape her prison but died in the process to something random in the Maw because it's just that dangerous. So the lore of the Maw was really dark, much darker than a lot of the other parts of Warcraft have ever really been, and it was all basically hidden. I really love the lore that was associated directly to the Maw, which is kind of sad that they just abandoned all of it because it was so incredibly disliked as a zone overall, and whatever plans they had of Venari were basically shelved, and they quietly wrote her out of the story. So, back on point, the Maw itself was a really well-implemented type of content that was unfortunately tacked onto another type of content that was normally thought of as very easy to the average player. The Maw was basically a hard mode version of outdoor max level solo content, something we haven't really ever had in World of Warcraft before. And I think the only disservice that Blizzard did with this new mode was making it the max level zone that everyone had to do in order to get the rewards. You see, WoW players kind of just like to do raiding, Mythic Plus, and PvP. And the people who don't like to do those max level versions of content don't really like max level zone content either because they just farm cosmetics all day. So the four types of players that take up a large amount of WoW's player base just do not care one bit that a piece of content they are required to do in order to do what they actually like takes so much time of their day and is also difficult to boot. 
They want the rewards now without having to put in the significant amount of effort, especially when they are just not on board for this type of content. If you're not playing the game because you want to mow like the maw, then the fact that it's really hard to do and time consuming is nothing but a detriment. It is completely reasonable to dislike being forced into a difficult piece of content when you'd rather do something else with your time. Kind of like how players are complaining about the Plunderstorm game mode because they want the rewards, but they don't want to have to do Plunderstorm to get them. They would rather get those rewards doing something they actually like to do rather than being forced to play a game mode that doesn't appeal to them. That doesn't mean the game mode is bad. On the contrary, I think the new Plunderstorm game mode is really good, actually. It's just people don't like being forced to do something that they don't want to do. And sadly, the Maw was exactly that. The Maw was a great beta version of sorts for hard max level solo content. The first version was kind of full of a lot of rough edges that could definitely be rounded out if they were given more time to work on it because the version of the mod we actually got was a rush job, believe it or not. You see, Shadowlands was kind of rushed to completion and by the time they hit their initial release date for Shadowlands, by their own words, they didn't even have the mod done yet. So everything that was implemented for the mod was basically done within the span of a month or two because they did delay the release of Shadowlands in order to finish it. And even as a rush job, I thought what we did get was actually really fun and enjoyable. But that's because I did sign up for the solo content. I enjoy the type of gameplay that the Maw offered. And I wish they went back to it and reiterated on it more, and had a new Maw style zone for each new expansion with more systems added to them. I think that what we had here was a great idea that was sadly thrown to the wayside, forced upon the players to interact with, and then abandoned because, to no one's surprise, Players didn't want to interact with it in mass because they don't like being told to do something they don't want to do, especially if it's not convenient. So here's how I think they could probably fix the Maw if they want to do something like it in the future. A small part of the appeal going to the Maw is getting power upgrades, so I think they could probably leave that in, just not giving exclusive power upgrades that you could only get from the Maw. For example, at the end of BFA, they had a mode called Horrific Visions, where when you completed a vision, you'd actually get a piece of equipment. But this piece of equipment was always worse than whatever was in the current raid tier, but it also had a chance of corruption on it, and guaranteed corruption in some cases. So it could legitimately increase the power level of your character if you did not raid, making it a solo alternative gear progression system that was not better than doing the already established power progression systems. So the idea of going into the mod in order to get power upgrades is appealing, and I think they should keep it, but as long as it's not better than Mythic Plus or raid gear and as long as it doesn't have systems that are required in order to complete Mythic Plus rating or PvP, and it was an optional mode you can opt into, like the Mage Tower system, would be the most ideal way of doing it. Or the idea of having purely cosmetic upgrades. That's the kind of direction they've gone in in more modern retail WoW, but they don't really like adding power progression to any non-endgame pillar content anymore. Even just having seasonal cosmetic rewards for doing a maw like system would be enough to incentivize people to want to do it and increase their gear in other game modes just to make doing this hard level max level zone easier to accomplish. Because I think a lot about what the maw fundamentally is just works, as long as people are not forced into doing it. Having to make full use of your character's kit in order to traverse a dangerous zone is fun. Having to build an exclusive min-max set for solo world content, being scared of dying because you'll drop all your currency, and happening upon hidden locations while exploring the map, a map that's dangerous by the way, is all just pure fun gameplay elements. And if the rewards were all purely cosmetic, you could do this game mode on any of your alts and not have to worry about only doing it on your main for the progression. Because honestly, I would rather have done the mod on my warrior than on my priest because I find world content more fun on my warrior. So not only was the mod not a bad zone, I think it was secretly WoW's best max level zone ever. And the reason no one knows it was because it was forced upon people instead of allowing people to opt into it.